Good evening, and welcome to the World Affairs Council's first 2017 fall season program. My name is Miriam Maldonado, and on behalf of the entire World Affairs team, we're so pleased to see all of our, our returning members, and also to welcome our first-time guests. And also, I'd like to introduce and recognize our distinguished guest, the Consul General of Japan, Consul Tetsuro Amano. We know you're going to enjoy the program this evening. The World Affairs Council partner and the Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA and the East West Center in Washington have partnered together to host tonight's panel presentation on US Japan partnership on energy business and the challenges and real challenges of China and South and North Korea. So we hope that you have a wonderful time. We hope that you're comfortable. If you have any problem in hearing at any time, just raise your hand. We want to let you uh, make sure we accommodate each one of you. And before we begin tonight, I'd like to highlight some of the upcoming lectures and events that we are going to be doing this fall. We hope that you received your fall calendar either in the mail or at your seat, or there's several in the back that we can have available for you. Make sure you pick one up before you leave tonight. It has a little snippet of things, some things that we're going to be doing in the fall. But of course, always visit our website because we have opportunities, events, programs, lectures, luncheons coming up all the time. So make sure that you uh, are opening our emails and that you're visiting our website often. So uh, how many of you are members of the World Affairs Council? Raise your hand. That is phenomenal. I'm excited about it. Well, me, I'm the newbie. I'm here three months, and I must tell you, I'm thrilled to be a part of the council. It's an outstanding team with an incredible, incredible mission of educating Houstonians on global understanding. We do this through lectures, we do this through um, educational programs with educators and students, and also through our renowned travel to international destinations. I know many of you have gone on our international destinations, and two I'm extremely excited about. One is to one of my favorite regions of the world. It's going to Cambodia, Vietnam, and Laos. I will be taking a tour, uh, a group, out in February, so if you're interested in joining us for that Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam tour. Please join me. I'll be hosting that. Later also in 2018, I am so pleased that Sandhya Bayou, many of you know, has been a longstanding um, icon with the World Affairs Council, will be taking a trip out to Eastern Europe to Belarus, Poland, and Kaliningrad. So these are just two um, international trips that we're putting together for you. We'd love to have you join us. We have international information sessions going on at the World Affairs Council next week. So if you're interested in finding out more information on these events, please check our website. We'd love to host you and have you for our info sessions, and you can find out more about what we're going to be doing on those trips. Also, I'd like to invite all of you to join us for our night of international travel and dinner. All of you must know by now that there is an annual World Quest, and it's coming up on November 9th. So get ready to build your teams. We're registering teams right now. It's going to be at the Royal Sinesta Hotel, which used to be the Intercontinental Hotel on the South Loop. And it's going to be November 9th. So make sure you register to attend the, that evening. And it's, it's going to be a wonderful opportunity to to rally together as corporate teams, as individual teams, as family teams, and take home that coveted World Affairs Council International World Crest Trophy. So with that, and now to begin our lecture, I want to remind everybody we have uh, question cards. Please make sure if you have any questions, we'll gather those uh, at the end, and you can submit them to one of our staff and bring them up to our panel for, for your questions to be answered. Well, let's begin. Tonight, I'm honored to introduce a man with nearly 40 years in career foreign service and an expert on U.S.-Japanese relations. Please help me and welcome the current Chief Executive Officer of the Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA, Ambassador Jim Zumwalt. <laughs> and I'll lead it to him to open our presentation tonight. Well, thank you very much. Can you hear me in the back? Yes? 
Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank the world, uh, very much our partners, the World Affairs Council and the East-West Center. And in particular, as we watched uh, events unfold in Houston and Washington DC, we weren't very confident that we'd be able to do this event because we knew the very, the very uh, severe uh, troubles that Houston was conducting. And we were pleased to hear from our partners that no, we'd like to go ahead. This is part of the uh, process of, of moving on, and we very much um, admire the spirit uh, in Houston, uh, the resilience and the hard work and the willingness to help neighbors. It was really inspiring for a lot of people who didn't go through what you went through. So I want to thank all of you for coming tonight, despite the various issues that I'm sure you're facing as well. And it really is a testament to me of how much you're interested in world affairs that you're, you came this evening. So I wanted to thank you all uh, very much. Um, we have a wonderful uh, panel this evening, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time introducing them, you, each in your program have a description of their, um, of their accomplishments, uh, but we're very excited. Um, the way we're going to work things out, we're going to first turn to uh, Ambassador David Shear to talk about U.S.-Japan's security relationship and the environment uh, in Asia, and then we'll turn to Satu, uh, Dr. Satu LeMay from the East-West Center, who's going to focus more on the economic relationship. He has a very exciting project. I think he'll tell you more about the Japan Matters for America project that he's working on. And then finally, we'll turn to Clara Gillespie uh, from the uh, uh, National Bureau of Asian Research, who's going to be talking, focusing a little bit on the energy industry, because we hear that there's some interest in Houston about <laughs> energy ties, and she's going to talk a little bit about some of the opportunities uh, that we, um, we uh, that, uh, with U.S.-Japan relations in this field. So let me, without further ado, turn things over first to uh, Ambassador Shear. Well, thanks very, very much, Jim, and thanks for having us uh, tonight. Um, it's a very uncertain time in Asia right now. And in international relations, uncertainty can often lead to insecurity, and insecurity can often lead to instability, and sometimes even conflict. So I think it's important for us tonight to ponder what the sources of uncertainty in Asia are. And when I talk to Asian diplomats, they have a lot of questions, and they're uncertain about a lot of things. But uh, three of their questions stand out. And those three questions are, what are we going to do about China's rise? What are we going to do about North Korean nuclear capabilities? And where is America going? Those are the three questions that really seize Asian diplomats, whether they're friends or partners or even uh, potential rivals like the Chinese. Uh, and. Uh, uh, I'd like to address all three of those questions briefly uh, as I start. First, with regard to China's rise. China wants to turn its wealth into economic influence in the region and globally. It wants to turn its wealth into military power. And that it, is, it has been very successful in doing so, uh, doing so, so far. Uh, uh, they, the, Chinese, as they do this, um, are not necessarily pursuing interests that are congruent with those of the United States or Japan. For example, the Chinese refer to our bilateral alliances, including our alliance with Japan, as relics of the Cold War that are obsolete and should be discarded. I think the Chinese would like to ultimately replace our alliances with a more multilateral, Sinocentric uh, security order and one day hope to wave goodbye to U.S. forces in the, in the Western Pacific. Another example of Chinese assertiveness uh, that's growing is their behavior in the South China Sea, where they've been creating artificial, uh, a lot of artificial islands in areas that they claim contrary to international law. Militarily, the Chinese uh, are spending a lot more money. Uh, until recently, their defense budgets were growing in by double digits. Over the past few years, uh, their, their budgets have grown by 8 to 9 percent. On the economic side, uh, one American economist has estimated that the Chinese can sustain $300 billion in outward foreign direct uh, inv uh, investment per year. That represents a big opportunity for the countries around China, China's per, uh, periphery, particularly in Southeast Asia, where there's a, a big infrastructure build out. They welcome the opportunity Chinese economic growth uh, presents, but they're also very wary about uh, Chinese influence and about Chinese uh, military power. Let's turn to North Korea. North Korea has tested over 20 missiles this year. 
depending on how you count the missiles, uh, depending on what type of missiles you, you include in your count. Uh, most recently, they, they have fired two ICBMs, uh, which can range much of the continental United States. The North Koreans have just tested a nuclear device, which they've called a hydrogen bomb. Uh, experts outside the government have estimated that that bomb had a power of between 120 and 250 kilotons. At 120 kilotons, that's eight times the power of the Hiroshima bomb. Kim Jong-un has called that a, a hydrogen bomb. We're not sure of that yet, but it was certainly more powerful than any other of uh, uh, the five previous North Korean nuclear tests. Once Kim Jong-un's ICBMs and nuclear warheads are operational, this will change the strategic uh, equation in Northeast Asia. It, will, it, it has begun to undermine the credibility of our guarantee, our extended deterrent to our allies, South Korea and Japan. Uh, and we have worked hard to uh, reinforce the credibility of that, that, uh, that guarantee. Um, some people have uh, called North Korean nuclear capability a game changer. Um, I'm not sure that's quite the case. The, the game uh, on the Korean peninsula for 60 years has been deterrence. It's con conventional deterrence, but it has worked. And my expectation is that nuclear deterrence will work as well. We are not on the verge of a nuclear war on the Korean peninsula. Kim Jong-un is not a madman. He wants nuclear weapons to protect himself from a United States he believes wants to overthrow his regime. With regard to American domestic politics, um, it's not just about President Trump's tweets, which have injected a lot of uncertainty into the region. It's about what leaders and elites in, in Asia believe to be the possible course of future American domestic politics. They look at our scandals, they look at our gridlock, and they wonder, over the long term, can the American political system produce outcomes that our allies can rely on? For decades, during the Cold War and after, we had a bipartisan foreign policy. That bipartisanship in our foreign policy, uh, Asians believe, and people elsewhere in other regions believe, has begun to break down. And should that bipartisanship break down finally, it'll affect our alliances, it'll affect our partnerships, and the way we interact with the rest of the world. So all three of these questions are on the minds of Asian leaders and Asian elites. And they're dealing with the uncertainty generated by these questions in four ways. First. Are, particularly our allies and partners are striving to improve their bilateral relations with the United States. Their leaders are striving to improve their personal relationships with President Trump. Second, um, this is a term from international relations theory, but our allies and partners have begun to balance China internally. They've begun to marshal their internal strength in order to generate leverage vis-a-vis -vis China. And to do that, they have increased their defense budgets, they are modernizing their military forces, uh, and they are, are deploying new kinds of weapon systems throughout the region. Uh, the third way in which they are responding to uh, regional uncertainty is by external balancing. They are improving their relationships with other like-minded countries, and you see this throughout the region, with Japan improving its defense relations with Australia, uh, Japan improving its relations with India. In fact, Prime Minister Abe is in India right now, and when they release their joint statement after their meetings are done, I'm sure there will be a, a strong defense component in that statement. Um, you see Australia and India, Japan, Australia, and India trilaterally strengthening their relationships. So countries are engaged not only in internal balancing vis-a-vis -vis China, they're engaged in external balancing. The fourth way in which they're uh, dealing with uncertainty is by adjusting their relations with China itself. 
Uh, Malaysia, in particular, has uh, uh, greatly strengthened its relationship with China. Their prime minister is in, was in Washington yesterday. But um, M Malaysia has been leaning towards China in, in a fairly pronounced way for the past year or two. Um, uh, Cambodia and Laos have tr traditionally close relations with China. They are even closer now. If you could turn each of these four activities into a dial, you would see that each country sets the dial on each of those activities in a different way. For example, J Japan's dial on its relationship with America might be at eight or nine, while Cambodia's dial on its relationship with America might be at two, I'd say or three at best. So each country is responding uh, in each of those areas in different ways. And it's making for uh, a much more complicated, uh, a much more complicated uh, uh, region right now. Let's look at how uh, Japan has stacked up in these areas and with regard to the relationship with the United States. We have an extremely close uh, alliance relationship with Japan. That relationship has strengthened under Prime Minister Abe. Prime Minister Abe is a very creative, visionary Prime Minister. He has a very uh, clear vision of where he wants to go with the United States, and he has implemented that vision consistently since he became Prime Minister. Prime Minister Abe was the first pr uh, Prime Minister to meet with President Trump even before President Trump's inauguration. He came in uh, November, shortly, I believe, shortly after the election. They had a very good meeting, established a very strong relationship even before President Trump was inaugurated. The Japanese also are balancing internally. President Abe discarded the 1% limit, uh, uh, GDP limit on Japanese defense uh, spending in March. This is an historic uh, decision by the Prime Minister, um, and it was paired with an increase in Japanese defense spending. The Japanese are buying F-35 fighter aircraft from the United States. They're buying P-8 surveillance aircraft for the conduct of undersea warfare from the United States. They are, they are uh, cooperating with us very closely in missile defense. Uh, the Japanese are also balancing external, as I suggested earlier. They have uh, greatly uh, strengthened their relationship, particularly with Australia. Um, and again, Prime Minister Abe is in India right now. Uh, the, the Japanese cooperate with us very closely on China. I don't expect there to be a war between China and the U.S. and Japan on the other side anytime soon, unless it's by mistake. The, the, uh, the, the way in which the region is shaped, given China's growing influence, will be through negotiation. It'll be through diplomacy. We won't sit down at a table and work everything out. It'll be negotiated case by case, as, as it is happening on the Korean Peninsula now, as is happening in the East China Sea and the South China Sea now as well. And in that kind of diplomatic effort, Leverage is everything. And when you need ever leverage, you need allies. That's why the U.S. relationship with Japan has strengthened. That's why it continues to be so important. The U.S. and Japan cooperate very closely on North Korea. We exchange lots of information on what's going on in North Korea regularly. We, our senior leaders coordinate on our respective policies toward North Korea. The Japanese support us very strongly in the UN Security Council as we pass sanctions resolutions on North Korea. We could simply could not deter North Korean aggression. We could not fight a war on the Korean Peninsula without an alliance uh, with Japan and forward deployed military forces in Japan. We have a carrier battle group in uh, Yokosuka. We have uh, F-35, Marine F-35B aircraft um, at Iwakuni. We have a Marine Expeditionary Force in, in Okinawa. Um, we, we have a very large F-22 air wing in Kadena Air Force Base in Okinawa. These forces will flow to the Korean Peninsula in the event of war. We couldn't flow them there 
uh, without the alliance in Japan. So Korea and Japan are, um, you, you might say, on the same strategic ch chessboard, and the alliance with Japan is critical to maintaining peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula. So the U.S. The U.S.-Japan alliance uh, is probably more important now than it, it has been in many years. It will be critical to deter uh, a continued deterrence on the Korean Peninsula. It will be critical to the way in which the region is shaped. Uh, uh, the U.S. and Japan will be important players in the future rules by which the region trades, in the future rules by which regional countries interact diplomatically. Um, so, so as we move forward in this age of uncertainty, the alliance with Japan is a, an island of certainty. And there's nothing like certainty. There's nothing safer than certainty in international relations. And there's nothing safer than a country that you can trust. We have built big trust with our Japanese counterparts over the past 60 years. And that trust forms a reservoir of, of goodwill that we can count on, that the Japanese can count on. And it shrinks the level of uncertainty. It shrinks our insecurity. And it shrinks the possible instability that results from that inse uh, insecurity. So um, I think uh, the, the, the alliance with Japan will remain very important to us. And I hope you will, too. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, David. That was a real uh, comprehensive view. I have a couple of questions I'll uh, ask maybe a little bit later. But now, um, you know, our relationship with Japan, security is a very important aspect of that relationship. But as David hinted, it was a very good segue. There's also a very important economic relationship. And so I'm hoping that uh, uh, Dr. LeMay can talk a little bit more about our economic relationship and maybe a little bit about the Texas relationship with Japan as well. Sure. Well, thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Uh, delight to be here. Um, the East West Center and Sasagawa Foundation, uh, Peace Foundation, have been working together for some years now on a project we call Japan Matters for America and America Matters for Japan. And basically, um, I hope some of you got copies uh, of the publication, which uh, you may have seen in the back. But if you didn't get a chance to uh, get a copy of this or they've run out, um, it's easily um, gettable on the, on the web. And uh, all you have to do is punch in in Google or whatever search engine you use, Japan Matters for America. And it should come up very soon at the top or others. And it's a, it's a very interactive, free site where you can go and, and um, uh, take a look at all the impacts of Japan. Uh, David did such a wonderful job of, of laying out the geopolitical and strategic context that frames the importance of the U.S.-Japan relationship. So let me make a couple of comments framing why we did the Japan Matters for America, uh, America Matters for Japan project, and why it's so present, uh, presently important in the context of David's last point about Asian questions about where the U.S. is going. As you know, a result of our country's uh, last elections in the context of the debate in foreign policy around those elections were, I thought, essentially three things. One was the question about the utility of alliances. And David has laid out the sort of strategic and geopolitical importance of the U.S.-Japan alliance. Um, but in that election campaign was also the question, what do you do beyond alliances? How are these relationships uh, important beyond just the military defense element. The second um, that came up a lot was the value or the mutual trade-offs between these alliance arrangements and trade and investment relations. What were the mutual gains? What were the outcomes? And the third was, of course, in the context of debates about American jobs and American economic uh, prosperity, was what are the local impacts of these relationships? And so the Japan Matters for America effort is, is an effort to understand the weight of Japan and the U.S. relationship in the international system at a national level and as it impacts every U.S. state and congressional district. So you can go on the site, click a state or click a congressional district, and look at how Japan matters to that area. 
and I just want to talk through a little bit. I don't want to bore you. It's in the evening. I'm going to go through a series of numbers, but I want to frame it. And one other important element is some of the narrative in the popular press and the general press is sometimes that Japan is on a downward trajectory or that Japan is not as important anymore. And we've seen to some extent, uh, well, to a great extent, the rise of China. We've seen to some extent the rise of uh, other players in the international system. But point one is how important Japan is in the global context. So just let me give you a couple of highlights of uh, why Japan is important. In the geopolitical context, other than what David said, just to remind that Japan is now the ho number one host in the world of U.S. forces, military forces. It's the number one U.S. arms export destination. It is the second source of U.S. employment created by foreign direct investment, roughly these numbers are a little tricky, but roughly 700,000 U.S. jobs are accounted for by Japanese foreign direct investment in the United States. That follows sec uh, second, as I said, so the natural question is who's won? Well, the United Kingdom. But um, I, I, you have to remember that the time span we're talking about the foreign direct investment is essentially the last 70 years of major Japanese FDI growth. And, and um, the UK has, of course, had a, has, had a longer time. Um, I also want to talk about the social and cultural dimensions because we've been talking a lot as we go around the country about local educational cultural relations. Uh, Japan is the number one in the uh, number one country in the world with sister city relationships with the United States. Hundreds of them all over the country. And as a person who grew up in Washington State in Seattle area, part of it was the educational, cultural, civic, uh, and um, of course, sushi and food relations between the U.S. and Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I could go through this. I'll, I'll just flag a couple of others. Japan is the third largest source of tourists to America, which as some of you know, is a $40 billion service industry and growing. I would note that uh, Japan is number three. I talked about jobs from foreign direct investment. It sits behind United Kingdom and Canada um, for uh, investment sources. And of course, you often have heard about trade. Let me mention a couple things about Texas, since um, Jim enjoined me to say a few things about uh, the importance to Texas. Um, among U.S. states, Texas ranks third uh, as an exporting uh, a state to Japan. Uh, it's number three for visitor spending uh, amongst U.S. states. It's um, one of, it's number three for jobs from exports that are sent to Japan. Um, it is uh, uh, fourth on the list of Japanese American pop by Japanese American population. Um, and it is number three for states in the union uh, for population employed by Japanese companies. Again, there are a lot of statistics. We rack them and stack them, as we used to say in the military, of uh, growth rates, trends per capita. Um, they're all in the booklet and on the website. But I, I wanted to flag uh, uh, some of these. Now, these numbers, of course, don't tell the full story because uh, one, uh, the numbers sometimes um, lag in terms of a, the year in which they're available and, and, and um, uh, can be calculated. Um, but the other important thing about Japan, I would state, is that it is still the third um, largest economy in the world. And that has profound implications for the rules, the norms, and the order setting agenda that the US has been responsible for in the post 1945 era. It's not just the military and economic strength of our country and the alliance, but the fact that that has gone hand in hand with the second or third largest allied economy, Japan, with which we share values and interests. So many things that we do in the international system and in the Asia Pacific were not only aligned on issues like sanctions on North Korea, how to handle uh, aggression and assertiveness in, in the maritime space and domain, but it goes hand in hand with the work we do in international organizations, international financial institutions, development banks. Without our cooperation, there would be a much more contested international um, 
rules and norms and standards. And so beyond that, and then the final thing, and I'll just close with this because I know my time is coming to a close, um, is, is um, the way in which the US and Japan have relationships bilaterally that are not easily quantifiable, like joint development of military equipment, like joint development of civilian aircraft coming from the home of Boeing. Um, without US-Japan cooperation, many of these projects could not work as efficiently without our um, mutual technological and, um, and economic um, cooperation. So I just want to flag this. Again, the site is called Japan Matters for America. Uh, and you can find it uh, very easily, and I hope you'll use the search engine to go down. There is a printable PDF. Uh, we use this a lot in our congressional outreach with Congress, um, and it maps out not only for every state, but every congressional district in the country. So um, let me end there and take any questions. Thanks. No, thanks very much, Sachin. I worked for many years. I was fortunate working in the US Embassy in Tokyo because while David was working on these security issues, and there usually weren't very good answers to a lot of the problems, I got to work on the economic relationship, which was fun and exciting, and it was all about cooperation and working together. And one of the areas where my Japanese counterparts were most interested in talking to the United States about was in the area of energy. And so we invited Claire here today to tell us a little more about developments and how there might be some opportunities in this area between the US and Japan. Thank you for that kind of introduction. Good evening. Can everyone hear me okay? Yours on. It should be on. I'm never yeah, very. It's on. Any better? All right. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right. I'm going to do this. <laughs> it's always my first question of can you hear me? So important to get out of the way. Um, you know, thank you for that kind introduction. And as I think both of our, or both of my fellow panelists very aptly hit upon, uh, at its foundation, the strength of the U.S.-Japan alliance has both an economic dimension and a security dimension. And energy cooperation is one of those things that, done, uh, when done well, can deliver in both of those arenas. Uh, Addressing access to reliable, affordable energy supplies is critical to achieving economic growth goals. And it's very important that we do so in a way that energy does not contribute to or lead to further competition or conflict. Um, and with that in mind, I think it's important to step back for a second and acknowledge how incredible it is and a testament to the strength of our relationship that we can talk about energy cooperation as one of the strengths of our alliance. Um, and that is given that the United States and Japan approach this question with some fundamentally different domestic challenges and considerations. While for the United States, we're increasingly talking about having entered this era of energy abundance, where we have increasingly available, affordable, diverse supply options and potential to play an increasingly important role as a major global supplier and exporter, Japan is facing a different outlook. Um, as of 2015, and as of today still, uh, Japan is 100% reliant on imports to meet its needs for coal, gas, and oil. Um, and these fuels make up north of 90% of the country's primary energy consumption. Um, it's a significant challenge and consideration for thinking about this dependence. Um, and it's had a profound impact on Japanese thinking about its energy strategies. Today, Japan is one of the most innovative countries in the world in terms of its energy policy making. Sorry, thank you. Um, it is a world leader in energy efficiency. Um, it is a critical R&D developer and investor, uh, both at home and in, in the region abroad, particularly in Southeast Asia, as well as here in the United States, playing a really contributing role uh, in the shale revolution itself. Um, and it's also been, in my opinion, one of the most forward-looking, thoughtful, and deliberate countries in thinking about how it articulates a role for energy uh, that can support mutual, sometimes competing, sometimes overlapping priorities for our economic, environmental, and geopolitical priorities. Um, and that leads me to one of my critical takeaways for this, which is when we talk about the opportunity for U.S.-Japan cooperation, there's both a bilateral dimension to this, uh, where there are 
are real needs and opportunities in one country that can address real challenges and deficiencies in the other. The opportunity of U.S. supply exports to Asia, technology, the role that Japan has played in investment and job creation, both here in Texas and in uh, cities and states across the region. But there's also an element and dimension to which the United States and Japan together have a real positive opportunity to exhibit leadership and um, positively shape the international region. Um, the Asia Pacific, uh, the Asia Pacific is now the world center of energy demand. Uh, between now and 2035, the region will account for about 66 percent of all total energy growth in the world. Uh, that's about four times the combined growth of Latin America and Africa combined. Uh, by 2035, that same year, Asia will account for half of all energy demand globally, and it's critically important that this not lead to further competition in conflict. Uh, for the region at large, energy security has often been viewed as a zero-sum competition uh, for limited scarce supplies, often at a high or volatile price. Uh, the United, Sta uh, United States and Japan have been important advocates in this discussion, talking about the role and importance of free and open markets in contributing to getting us out of that mindset. Um, and within that, thinking about a market-based approach to energy policy. So what does that mean in terms of some of the specific opportunities? Well, for thinking about that market-based approach, uh, last November, the Japan-US Business Council convened a discussion among senior stakeholders from industry, government, and business to talk about what they saw as the current landscape. And on the energy side, they came away with roughly seven arenas where they saw there being great potential for US-Japan cooperation. Um, and I won't go into detail in all these sectors, but it was really comprehensive comprehensive um, in terms of the areas and sectors it covered, but also in its acknowledgment of some of the near-term challenges facing decision makers and the need for leadership. And this ranged from issues such as articulating the future role for nuclear energy in a post-Fukushima Daiichi environment, uh, thinking about the continued importance and need for coal in the Asia Pacific and how to move that to a cleaner, more sustainable utilization, the growing importance of LNG and national strategies. And and then also more high-level conversations about how you articulate and identify the need for a more sustainable energy mix, uh, as well as address emerging challenges such as climate change. And these are issues that have really resonated on the government-to-government -government side as well. We've seen them come up. Uh, <laughs> thank you. We've seen them um, come across in numerous uh, bilateral statements over the past two decades, uh, leading up to and including statements this summer uh, made by. Pence and Asso, uh, as well as Secretary Perry and his counterpart in Tokyo. Um, and one area, of, oh, thank you. And one area that's gained particular interest and attention and something that I think is of particular value for our discussion here is the growing possibility and potential for liquefied natural gas in the Asia Pacific. Um, Gas is now growing at it, gas consumption is now growing at a faster rate in Asia than anywhere else in the world. Um, between now and 2035, it's expected that global LNG trade will triple. Most of those supplies are envisioned as being directed to the Asia Pacific. Um, governments have prioritized greater utilization of natural gas in their energy mixes for any number of reasons, um, including the uh, expectations about the increased availability and affordability of supply, uh, as well as goals to accelerate switching from less efficient and more CO2 emitting sources. Um, in 2011, the IEA declared that these factors were really contributing to the prospects for a golden age of natural gas in Asia. We're still in some ways asking the question of if we've reached that golden age yet. Um, and there are real significant uncertainties and questions where the United States and Japan also have a particular role to play. In its most direct bilateral sense, uh, one of the opportunities is that Japan is the world's largest importer of LNG the U.S. has significant supplier potential. That's a direct benefit. Um, Japan has been very engaged in R&D and development and projects here in the state of Texas as well. Um, but in the broader sense, there are a number of questions about how we can move to a more sustainable, reliable market and expectations. 
governments across the region have real questions about infrastructure development, for example. Um, starting from such a low utilization base, there's significant need to invest in everything from ports to shipping um, to other just general supply chain needs. To put this in specific terms, a recent study out of the Jakarta-based area think tank uh, tried to look at the demand challenges in ASEAN and India in particular, seeing these as really being the key drivers and expectations about demand growth. And their estimate was that for infrastructure alone, the investment need was north of $80 billion. And that's before you talk about the supply and the other challenges. It's a real question about how you get the risk conditions right to a evaluate attracting the necessary investment. Uh, Japan, on its part, has been a critical partner in talking about the development of high quality infrastructure development, uh, particularly in Southeast Asia, prominent role. The United States, as well, is very interested in making sure that any efforts uh, promote a flow towards a more secure, reliable market. Um, and maybe la one last comment, and then I'll turn it back over to our discussion. And that is, it's all very well, in, uh, very well said and done to talk about the geopolitics of energy not needing to be so contested or uh, contentious, um, but ensuring that we move towards that direction and away from a zero-sum mindset really requires action. Um, and that action is about ensuring the safe, reliable, uh, free flow of energy supplies. Um, both the United States and Japan have been strong advocates of that. Um, it's a very important area for our cooperation and where we can support rising levels of global prosperity. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to be asking each of our panelists a couple of questions. and. Um, but after that, I'd like to open things up to the audience. So I think if you have, you have cards to ask questions on, if you could um, start writing down your questions and hold them up, and someone will collect those cards, and then we'll try and get to those as well. Uh, so thank you. I see some people are already here with their cards in hand, so hopefully someone will pick those up, and we can, uh, we can get to your questions as well. Um, I guess my first question um, is for David. Um, you talked about the North Korea, and you gave us given some of the other things we've been reading, a rather um, reassuring message about uh, deterrence will continue to work. Um, but the one area that you didn't address that I'd be interested in your thoughts on is the risk of nuclear proliferation, given North Korea's um, development. So could you talk about that risk a little bit and what we can do to mitigate that risk? Um, it will be very difficult, as it has been for some years now, for the United States to get North Korea to give up its nuclear weapons. Uh, Kim Jong-un believes that nuclear weapons are important for his survival. He doesn't want to give them up. Uh, a, a deal, arriving at a deal with Kim Jong-un will be very difficult. We are not going to recognize North Korea as a nuclear weapons state. We have said we will never recognize them as a nuclear weapons state. Um, we will continue to press the North Koreans on this. But while we wait, we'll probably end up doing three things. One is we will continue pressure on the North through sanctions and diplomacy. Two is we will enhance our deterrent capabilities. Um, and we will do so uh, in consultation with our Japanese and South Korean allies. And the third thing we'll do is contain North Korea. We will try to prevent North Korea from proliferating nuclear weapons, technology, and uh, equipment. Um, and that's where Jim's question comes in. I think um, we'll be working very hard in the coming uh, months to enhance our deterrent capabilities and to work on containing uh, North Korea. And this will not just be a, a unilateral U.S. effort. It will first require close cooperation among the U.S., the ROK, and Japan trilaterally. It'll require cooperation from China as well. It's been very difficult to uh, first get China to support wide-ranging sanctions in the U.N. Security Council on North Korea. We've done so inch by inch. We have a common interest, a strong common interest, I think, however, with China in preventing proliferation of North Korean nuclear technology. So 
I don't know what the U.S. government is thinking in detail on this, but uh, my belief is that we're going to have to start talking to the Chinese trilaterally with U.S., Japan, uh, South Korea, all aligned on all three of these areas, pressure, deterrence, and containment. We're going to have to start talking to China about all of those. Thank you. Thank you very much. And a good segue to my second question for you, which is um, you talked about external balancing and the roles of various countries, but could you uh, talk a little bit about the Japan-Korea relationship and how that might be a part of an external balancing strategy? Well, the, the uh, Japan-Korea re bilateral relationship, of course, has a lot, carries a lot of historical baggage with it. Uh, as, as Jim uh, mentioned in his presentation, in a different presentation earlier today, the, 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 the Republic of Korea's Independence Day is the day they were liberated from Japan by the U.S. So the, the ROK celebration of its independence remains a, a, a sensitive issue between Japan and the ROK. And people in the region, not just Japan, watch the ROK president's Independence Day speech very closely. Um, so there's a lot of historical baggage in the bilateral relationship. However, there are lots of good reasons why Japan and Korea should have uh, good, closer relations. A, because of China. B, because of North Korea. And we've seen over time that the bilateral relationship has gradually um, uh, grown more stable. And that, that stability is based also in part on very, very strong bilateral economic relations. Um, over the past couple of years, we have um, uh, created a new forum in Northeast Asia, which is trilateral U.S.-Japan ROK exchanges. These are very important. These exchanges take place at all level of, levels of government, from the, presi from the president on down to the deputy assistant level, deputy assistant secretary level. Um, president Trump, Prime Minister Abe, and President, or, uh, president Moon had a very good trilateral meeting in July in Hamburg on the margins of the G20 meeting. We had a trilateral defense meeting uh, on the margins of the Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore in uh, early June. So these, these trilateral exchanges are very important. They're a new element in Northeast Asia security, and they're a new element in the way in which we are balancing externally uh, uh, among ourselves. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my next question is going to be for Satu, but before that, I just wanted to add one other element of um, Japan-Texas relations that are, is very important, and that is our space cooperation. Mm -hmm. uh, you probably know there are Japanese astronauts living in Houston. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they live here for years because they're training for their missions. It's a lot of work. Their families go to schools here. Um, I've several times accompanied Japanese astronauts for, when they come from Houston back to Japan. They do a lot of going to schools and talking about space exploration and why it's important. But they also talk about the wonderful time their families have in Houston. So these people are, in a sense, ambassadors for Houston when they come back to Japan. And it's really wonderful to see that kind of space collaboration. We get a lot out of this because it's, uh, we can, it's very expensive to explore space. It's risky. We want to take advantage of the best Japanese technology. So there are good reasons why we do this cooperation. But because their uh, center of their cooperation is here in Houston, it gives your, uh, your region an extra benefit uh, as well. So I just want to briefly yeah. mention that as well. But so too, um, I was, you know, when you um, working on this project, it's a tremendous amount of work to take each congressional district and get all the data on back in the details on things like how many Japanese college students live in the district mm. and those kinds of things. But um, some things were you know, obvious. I mean, I think we all know that, gee, there's a lot of trade and a lot of investment. So it's not surprising to hear the results. But when you did this study, um, what things surprised you that came out that were different than what you thought uh, from your, your work on why Japan matters? Sure. Yeah, it is uh, uh, very difficult to do calculations at the congressional district, um, and this is not at all meant to be a political observation, but it's a statistical one. It's particularly hard when congressional districts are under legal challenge and get changed, um, because apportioning data oh, yeah. to districts via zip codes and previously customs union is not mathematics. It's a little bit of art. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, steeped as I am in understanding the algorithms and the mathematics that we try to use, 
this, this is not physics. This is um, statistics. So um, with that caveat, I think the biggest findings we have, I think there's really three big takeaways. One is how important Japan is to every state in the Union, but broadly across the United States. No country has that um, scale and depth, scale, and breadth of interaction on different forms of relationship. So Japanese trade, Japanese investment, Japanese cultural activities, education programs, sister city relationships are truly a national phenomenon. The second thing is, as I said, the project is called Japan Matters for America, America Matters for Japan. There's also a reverse narrative that's important. Is many in Asia, with the rise of China, including, I might add, very close friends in Australia, including my colleagues in the Australian government, worry that their citizens are beginning to believe that the US is no longer important. And so if you'll, when you see the publication as well as the website, you'll see that we also show the interactions of the US importance by every Japanese prefecture. And that gives you a way of thinking about how prefectures and local uh, connections are strong. So not only is Japan nationally present in the United States, but localities in the US have direct relations across prefectures in Japan. So that was the second um, really big finding. And the third is when we compare Japan with all of our major Asia Pacific partners, China, Korea, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, India, um, and we have separate publications for each of these. Japan stands miles above in ev almost every category. Now, people will immediately point out and say, well, Japanese students to American universities have declined. And that is true. But it's offset by a growth, a pretty strong growth, in Japanese non-university programs and a lot of other uh, what might are not statistically captured interactions in education. And the U.S. still remains an important source for Japan of foreign students. The United States, for example, is the only non-Asian uh, country that is in the top 10 of U.S. American students going to Japan. So those are some examples of things that I frankly, when we started the project, wouldn't have guessed. And it keeps coming out and also explains now why Congress has a very active U.S.-Japan caucus because Japan now has implications for all kinds of governor's visits, mayoral visits, congressional visits because it has implications for educational, civic, trade, investment relations. And I'm glad you mentioned the Japan caucus because one of the chairs is from Texas. He's That's not right. from Houston, but he's, he's from Texas and a very strong supporter That's of right. the uh, uh, Congressman Castro. So he's, he's a, a big supporter of U.S.-Japan relations. And we very much appreciate that kind of support in, in Congress. Um, um, Claire, I did want to ask you, because you talked about the, I realized it was hard to compress into, say, it's a, lot of areas. a lot of areas. So I'm going to just pick a couple of them that I'm hoping you can develop a little further. But the one thing that really interests me about uh, U.S.-Japan energy relations, you talked a lot about Japan as a potential market, which is wonderful. But I, another area is um, technology. And could you talk a little bit, because Japan, it seems to me, has wonderful technology in reducing energy consumption and energy efficiency. And, but what are the opportunities for the U.S. and Japan in utilizing some of the technology that each of us have and other areas where we could work together to leverage the, the technology that each of us possess? That's a really great question. And I think I want to start with one of the more provocative areas in it, which has been something where the Japan, uh, where Japan and the United States have not always come at it from the same perspective. Um, and that is the opportunity and potential for clean coal technology. Um, you know, the United States still relies on coal for a significant share of our energy mix, um, and ensuring that we strengthen its usage and reduce CO2 emissions is a priority U.S. goal that has been true across administrations. Uh, with the current Trump administration, we're now talking increasingly about uh, revitalizing U.S. coal industry, but how we do that in a way that promotes both um, 
energy security in water and air. Um, for Japan, I think the country has taken sometimes a more nuanced and at times helpful position on that, especially in the context of the broader region. Um, a few years back, there was a major discussion among uh, OECD countries about the role and potential for coal financing as well as coal power plant development. And the US position was very strongly opposed to being engaged in the discussion, whereas the Japanese official position was talking about the projections and estimations in Asia, uh, which in no scenario showed a decreasing use of coal. And so the government highlighted very specifically, one, it's important we acknowledge what is going on in trends in the region. Um, two, if this is the trend, how can we do it in a much better, more sustainable way? And three, to what extent do we have to acknowledge that if we're not involved in this discussion, it's not a discussion that stops happening. Uh, China has been a major investor and development in coal power plants as well. And one of the critiques is that these are not always at the higher, more efficient standards that we would want to see uh, that the US and Japan have led on. So coal power is one that I would highlight. Um, yeah. Okay. And then a follow-up question. Um, another area where it seems like there's a lot of potential for cooperation is in setting the international rules and standards. I mean, you're getting at this, I think, yeah. with the clean coal, but could you talk a little more about that potential collaboration working together in international organizations and other places uh, to, uh, to promote our interests in standard setting and rulemaking? Oh, absolutely. And one of the challenges is that as of right now, there's no true umbrella energy architecture for the region that covers all of the nations that are now making up the majority of this world energy growth. Um, you know, for the International Energy Agency in particular, you have membership that was based on OECD countries and expectations about who the major players were in the 1970s. That's a dramatically different environment. Um, China is not an OECD founding mem uh, member country, uh, but we're now seeing steps to move and integrate not only China, but India, Indonesia, and others into this umbrella. And that's something that, frankly, has been led by the United States and Japan in particular. Nobuo Tanaka, I was thinking of, was a very strong advocate for this during his days as the head of the IEA. And this was something that was not without controversy, because bringing China, bringing these other emerging players into architecture brings in new questions about what roles they might have in leadership and also the ability to shape norms and standards. Um, clearly, we view that there is a um, strong value and importance and benefit to having open, secure markets. Um, it's part of the US success story in terms of our own development, and we believe that trade brings mutual benefits. Um, it's not something that you can ignore by setting China off to the side. Um, I think you see questions about this in other institutions. The immediate US response to the Chinese-led AIB is something that comes to mind, uh, where we had immediate concerns about engagement. I think we were a little too aggressive at that time. Now we're talking about China's led uh, Belt and Road Initiative. I think the response to that has been much more positive. Okay, well, we have now some questions from the audience. So why don't we shift gears a little bit? Um, let's see, it says name optional. So most people did not put their name here, but I'll read the anonymous questions. Um, so uh, let's see. The first is um, How has Japan's reassessment of its military size and purpose been received both within Japan and the region? Maybe I'll ask David to start and uh, take a crack at that. I'd say mixed in both. Hmm. Um, I think the Japanese population remains um, very cautious about the extent to which Japan should, shall we say, remilitarize. Um, uh, and this, this um, uh, current of opinion of Japan has always been very strong, and it remains very strong. And I think public support for uh, Prime Minister Abe's uh, effort to revise the Constitution is not 100% solid. So this, this current of opinion remains very strong um, in Japan. At the same time, there is, I think, uh, among the Japanese population at large, not just in the elite, that there's a growing realization that Japan needs to play a stronger role in the region and in the world by itself and in conjunction with its ally, the United States. Um, and you see this in part in the success with which 
Prime Minister Abe has incrementally changed the way in which uh, Japan uh, uh, has decided to use the military as a tool of statecraft. Um, there has been a gradual loosening on, on restrictions on what Japan can do uh, with the military and in terms of selling military items overseas under Prime Minister Abe, but that trend has been building quite a bit over time. So in Japan, it's mixed, but we are, we are gradually moving towards a place, I think, where, where um, military affairs are normalized in Japanese public opinion. Um, it's mixed in the region as well. The Chinese don't like the idea of a remilitarized, renationalized Japan. The Chinese always liked it when the United States was largely responsible for Japan's defense. Um, and as Japan's role in the region has evolved, the Chinese have spoken up. Other countries in the region, however, um, share common interests with the ja Japanese and are quite receptive to a larger Japanese role in the region in general and a larger Japanese military role in particular. Um, one such country is Vietnam. Vietnam has a very complicated relationship with China. As an American, you go to Vietnam and you wonder, why do they like us so much? And the Vietnamese will often tell you, well, we fought one war with you, but we fought 17 wars with the Chinese. <laughs> um, so their, their relationship with China is very complicated. It's even more complicated now with their uh, disagreements over who, who uh, owns what in the South China mm -hmm. Sea. The Vietnamese are balancing internally. They're balancing it by building their military forces. They're balancing externally by improving their relationships, not just with the US, but with Japan as well. So Japan welcomes a stronger Japanese, or uh, Vietnam welcomes a stronger uh, role uh, by Japan and is working with Japan to build its, its maritime security capabilities. So that's a very bright spot in Japan's uh, regional role. Um, in fact, you are so brilliant, you answered the next question I was going to ask, <laughs> which is uh, how are other nations in the region, such as Vietnam, the Philippines, and South Korea, how do they view, uh, or, do, or are they considering strengthening ties with Japan because of China's rise? And I think you've answered that for Vietnam. Let me just briefly mention a little bit about um, Republic of Korea, because uh, I think both of us have participated in U.S.-Korea-Japan defense trilateral talks, where we actually are talking about concrete things the three of us can do working together. And um, you know, it was very interesting to me because I think in Korea at the political level, there is anxiety about Japan and its growing military strength because of history. But the Korean military is looking at Korea's national security interests and they see this huge threat from the north. And they have an all of the above strategy. We have to do every single thing we can to, ma to promote our national security. And one of those things they can do is working together with Japan. So at the military to military level, as long as things didn't, weren't pol uh, politicized, there was a tremendous desire to move forward. One of the big achievements recently was the Koreans and Japanese signed an agreement to protect each other's military information. And what that means is you can share sensitive information because now you're confident that your partner will be uh, safeguarding that information. The United States has such an agreement with both countries, but it was a real watershed for trilateral cooperation to see the third leg of the triangle, the Japan-Korea leg, also conclude such an agreement. So I'm optimistic that despite some of the challenges of history that David mentioned, Japan-Korea relations will continue to improve. And the main reason, frankly, is the shared threat that Japan and Korea face uh, from North Korea. Um, let's see. Uh, we have a good question, and I'll throw this open to anyone to answer because there's a lot of aspects to this. But comments on Japan's relation with Russia and the impact for the United States. There's an energy aspect to this, so I might ask Claire, do you want to start with the energy side of that? And then I might turn to Satu and David to, to go on as well. Yeah, and Japan has had a very complex, nuanced relationship with Russia, in, and one that is in some ways a more positive and less complex and nuanced relationship than the relationship that the U.S. has had with Russia. Um, for Japan, if one of the goals of energy security is to support supplier diversification, um, and in particular, strong current reliance on Middle Eastern supplies, Russia is one among many of those potential viable options. Um, it both has ample supplies of oil and gas, but is also a nearby 
my neighbor, which offers interesting opportunities in terms of both cost and speed of accessing supplies. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Did you want to add something to about Russia? Uh, can I pick up on the, the, this last question about yes. Japan's more active role? Yes. Uh, because it relates to Russia, but uh, I'll let David speak specifically about Russia. Um, and one of the things is, as Japan begins to slightly loosen and incrementally loosen restrictions, three in particular, I think, are important. One is the restrictions on arms exports. The second is, as you know, Japan has been a major source of overseas development, official development assistance to countries around the region for development purposes. They've now kind of begun to integrate what is called the strategic use of official development assistance, a more strategic thinking about this. Um, and the third, of course, is being more militarily active, m working more closely with the alliance. Why this is important in the region, I think, is from India East, you see the application of the restrictions to concrete new relationships. Example one, still not completed, may never be completed, but discussions between India and Japan on the sale of a US-2 uh, aircraft. The failed but very important major deal in which Australia and Japan discussed buying Japanese submarines. Um, and and um, uh, example of the strategic use of ODA. India and Japan recently signed, and as David said, um, Japanese Prime Minister uh, Abe is in uh, Delhi every day, today or tomorrow, um, a new Asia-Africa growth corridor, which is an attempt to build linkages and infrastructure capacity across the Indo-Asia Pacific region where India and Japan would cooperate. These are signs of the kind of things that Japan is able to do. Patrol boats and maritime security provision to countries in Southeast Asia. These are new dimensions of the relationship that are for the most part very welcome in the region. And so that, I, I wanted to build on, on what sure. David said. A very, very good point. Um, maybe we can go on to a different question sure. if that's yeah. okay. Um, a very good question from uh, Catherine Jones from the Bush School of Government and Public Service, who mentioned that we, uh, David, you talked about vis-a-vis uh, -vis North Korea, U.S., Japan, China cooperation is very important, but do disputes uh, regarding the South China Sea, will that impinge our ability to work together with China uh, to, to work on the North Korean problems? And I would maybe add into that East China Sea as well as South China Sea. Mm. Um, the East China Sea, uh, of course, centering on the, the Senkaku Gyaoyutai Islands, or the Senkaku Islands, um, uh, started in 20, the, the, our, the Senkakus are in dispute between Japan and China. Um, uh, the, the dispute heated up in 2012 when the Japanese government bought the islands from a, a private owner, a private Japanese owner. The Chinese were incensed by this, and the, they began pressuring the Japanese diplomatically and pressuring the Japanese around the islands by sending lots and lots of fishing boats, at Coast Guard cutters, uh, to the vicinity of the islands with PLA Navy vessels just off the horizon. So, um, and, and I think tensions Culminate, the Consul General can, can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think tensions culminated around 2015, 2016, and have basically sort of, in the past year maybe, have stabilized at a certain level of tension with Chinese Coast Guard vessels and fishing boats continuing to challenge the, uh, fairly regularly the Japanese claim and the Japanese scrambling both Coast Guard cutters and fighter aircraft to signal the Chinese. So the East China Sea remains a, a, a bone of contention between Japan and, China, uh, uh, Japan and China. In 2014, when President Obama visited Tokyo, President Obama declared that uh, the Senkakus are covered by the Mutual Security Treaty, which was a big, important deal for the Japanese and for the alliance. It basically means that if the Chinese invaded those islands, we're obligated to come to Japan's defense. Um, uh, and that greatly strengthened 
um, Japanese confidence in the alliance, I believe. So East China Sea is, is sort of stable for the moment. Um, South China Sea, somewhat less stable. Um, uh, and generally, these issues have not affected the extent to which the Chinese have cooperated or not with us on North Korea. Um, some people say we should cut a deal with the Chinese on the South China Sea, uh, give them the South China Sea, and uh, ask the Chinese that, to turn off the oil to North Korea. There's no such deal possible. North Korea is too important for Chinese security for them to give up on other areas or to make deals in other areas that are also important to Chinese security. So I don't see a strong strategic connection between the South China Sea and North Korea. But if the overall relationship between the U.S. and China deteriorated, we'd have problems cooperating with China on North Korea. Okay. Um, I'm told we just have a few more minutes, so I'll try and get through the last two questions. But the next one's for Clara. Um, what are the projections for LNG exports from the United States to Japan, and how has Fukushima changed the energy framework in U.S.-Japan energy framework? Yeah, so to begin with the second question, how has the Fukushima uh, triple disaster impacted Japan's energy framework, uh, and as well as the framework for our cooperation? The short answer is significantly. Um, prior to the disaster, nuclear energy made up about a third of Japan's overall electricity mix, and the expectation and strategy was that uh, it would reach 50% of the overall mix. Immediately after the, the disaster, um, Japan Japan went to 0%. And we've since seen some of the reactors come back online, uh, questions about how we grow and sustain the role of nuclear in the mix. Um, Phyllis Yoshida, we were talking about, did an excellent analysis looking at some of um, Japan's long-term COP21 goals, talking about how even moving out to 2050, you see a growing and rising role for nuclear. But there's still significant question about how much of a role that plays in the overall mix. And that has a number of implications. One is when you did have that dramatic loss of a third of its energy mix, the most immediate pivot in Japan's energy strategy was an uptick and increase in imports of both uh, coal and natural gas. Um, and and for the markets of 2011, 2012 in particular, uh, this had a significant role in tightening uh, markets for natural gas. Um, it led to one in Japan very high prices, about um, $17, I believe, went around the United States at the same time we were talking about the 2 to $3 range, so huge significant discrepancy in cost. Um, it also sent very strong signals about the potential for demand, which helped to lift U.S. production as well. Um, so this has become an increasingly part, uh, important part of our trade and um, production relationship. In the past 18 months, uh, we've already been seeing as we had before, um, U.S. energy exports and U.S. LNG exports going to Japan. Um, in the past 18 months, Japan, I believe, ranked as the number one destination for U.S. exports in Asia. Um, I believe in terms of exports overall, it's still ranked in the top five, and it's seen as being a significant part of the market. Um, but that being said, Japan's overall energy consumption is relatively stable, and it's not expected to uh, grow significantly. So where our role or where our outputs grow from there is based on a number of factors. One is kind of that evolving uncertainty on natural um, nuclear energy, which will play into that. Two is the overall competitiveness and potential of U.S. energy exports. That's on one hand the question about price and where we fit in alongside other suppliers such as Australia, Qatar, uh, even Indonesia. The other is a very real question about about U.S. policy limitations. Uh, and for that in particular, US still, the United States still has on the books restriction of, US, or of LNG exports to non-FTA countries, and that would include Japan. Uh, there is an exemption process through which we go through this, but Japan, as well as other partners in Asia, including the, uh, the Republic of Korea and China, have raised questions about whether or not this can be politicized. Um, so working together on assurances there has been an important part of our framework. 
Okay. No, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, by the way, for mentioning um, Dr. Yoshida's book or her uh, paper. Uh, uh, it's called Japan's Energy Conundrum, Conundrum, and it's available at the Sasakawa website for any of you who are interested in her thoughts on the challenges Japan faces with its uh, energy. Um, we have about one more minute left, so I'm going to ask uh, to, uh, to do something very difficult, which is to give a one-minute answer mm -hmm. to a very complex okay. question. Um, how concerned are Japan and others in the region over President Trump's decision to leave TPP? Mm -hmm. I'm sure you can find a one-minute answer to that. <laughs> Extremely disappointed, uh, but uh, still carrying the torch for the TPP in negotiations they're having with the other 11 signatories, um, and that process continues. Um, Japan is in a unique position of being both a signatory or member of the TPP uh, group of countries and also the regional comprehensive economic partnership. So Japan is in tandem seeking further trade liberalization through both avenues. But of course, everything we know is that Japan was terribly disappointed and upset by the decision. I would only amend the question to say, by the American general public's opposition to TPP, including all three major candidates, not only the current president. Right. Well, thank you. That's a good, good clarification. Um, thank you all very much. You've been a wonderful audience. Asked some great questions. I very much appreciate your coming tonight. Please join me in once again thanking our ambassadors, as well as Dr. LeMay and Ms. Gillespie. Thank you again. Let's appreciate them.